Hotel. It is Thursday, May 12th, 2022, and we are live. Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. All right, so uh, on today's show, we're going to deal with an update of the Clotilda slave ship in Alabama. And the Clotilda is the last known slave ship to come into the U.S. Back in May 19, back in May 2019, uh, the Clotilda was discovered in Alabama and there was a recent development there was a development uh that came out today because of new research that is being done on the clotilda uh this month okay so we're going to talk about this uh nbc news has a story they picked up from the associated press then also national geographic has an article as well that came out today uh on this now you know we've been talking talking about the clotilda on this show the past few years and uh zora neale hurston's last book uh barracoon was uh, was uh about it was an interview uh, part of the book was an interview with kudjo lewis who for a long time we thought was the last uh living survivor of the clotilda we know it, it was in about 2018 that uh, Zora Neale Hurston's last manuscript was published, and that was dealing with uh, Kudjo Lewis. Okay, so we'll discuss that as well. All right, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you haven't taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, if we look at this story here from NBC News, and we're going to get into some background information dealing with the Clotilda. And these 110 Africans were brought into the U.S., because of a bet by a wealthy white landowner named Timothy Mayer, Timothy Mayer, who bet some other white businessmen that he could bring a slave ship into the U.S. even though it was illegal, okay? Even though it was illegal. So if we look at this article here from uh, NBC News that was picked up from the Associated Press. This article came out today. Alabama shipwreck holds key for descendants of enslaved Africans. Alabama shipwreck holds key for descendants of enslaved Africans. The question is, give me a timetable. What's the date for getting that boat out of that doggone water? Asked African town resident and activist Joe Womack. And when these Africans are, are freed after the Civil War, you're going to have 31 of them who are going to set up the town of Africa Town, USA. And it's going to be uh, in Alabama, southern portion of Alabama. They're going to uh, save their money, buy land, and set up this town. This town still exists today, African Town, US, uh, Africa Town, USA. So keys to the past and the future of a community descended from enslaved, from enslaved Africans lie in a river bottom on Alabama's Gulf Coast, where the remains of the last known U.S. slave ship rest a few miles from what's left of the village built by the newly freed people after the Civil War. So we know Civil War ends 1865. We know um, General Robert E. Lee surrenders April 9th, 1865 to General Ulysses S. Grant. Now, even though the Civil War is going to continue until August 1866, basically for all practical purposes, 
that's looked at as the end of the Civil War, okay, uh, in April 1865. Now, work, work performed this month, May 2022, will ha help answer a question residents of the area called Africatown, USA, are anxious to resolve. Can remnants of the slave ship Clotilda be retrieved from the water to both fill out details about their heritage and to serve as an attraction that might revitalize the place their ancestors built after emancipation. Now, a crew hired by the Alabama Historical Commission working over 10 days ending Thursday, May 12, 2022, took fallen trees off the submerged remains of the ship, scooped muck out of the hull, H-U-L-L, -L, hull, and retrieved displaced pieces to see what's left of the Clotilda, which is described as the most intact slave ship ever found. It's described as the most intact slave ship ever found. The work will help determine what, if anything, can be done with the wreckage in years ahead? Now, some want a museum featuring the actual Clotilda slave ship, which was hired by a rich white steamship captain named Timothy Meyer, Timothy Mayer, uh, a rich white steamship captain, on a bet to violate the U.S. ban on slave importation the year before the Confederacy was founded. So this ship comes in about July, 1860, the year before the Civil War ends, the year before the Civil War begins. And um, so uh, the year before the Confederacy was founded to preserve slavery and, and white supremacy in the South. Now, the question is, give me a timetable. What's the date for getting that boat out of that doggone water? Africa Town resident Joe Womack asked team members during a public forum, forum as work began. Now, nearby at a new heritage house that could display artifacts is under is under construction. Now, if we look at, um, I want to flip over here and look at the uh article here from uh well there's an article from national geographic and let me see something here because i have to log in to my national geographic account here in uh firefox i gotta try to do that on the break i have it up in uh i have it up in uh, I have to log into it in Google Chrome. I have it up in Firefox. But there was a ban. The, the international transatlantic slave trade was abolished January 1st, 1808. Okay. And we've talked about this here on the show before. Uh, if we look at this article from history.com, official website of the History Channel. This deals with March 2nd, 1807. Congress abolishes the African slave trade. Congress abolishes the African slave trade. This is why when I talk about reparations, repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, different things like this, we don't understand how to make legal arguments for reparations. Okay. We don't understand how to make legal arguments for reparations. And the reason why the international transatlantic slave trade was abolished was because of article one, because of article one, section nine, clause one of the U S constitution that most of our people haven't read. So we don't understand any of this. March 2nd, 1807 Congress abolishes the African slave trade. The U S Congress, passes an act to prohibit the importation of slaves into any port or place 
within the jurisdiction of the United States from any foreign kingdom, place, or country. From any foreign kingdom, place, or country. The first shipload of African captives to the British colonies in North America arrived in Jamestown, Virginia, August 16, 19, even though codified slave laws did not exist in any of the 13 colonies then. The first colony to have codified slave laws was Massachusetts, 1641. Okay, now, uh, if you skip past some of this. After the uh, after the war, as in slave labor was not as crucial after the American Revolutionary War. As a slave labor was not as a crucial element of the northern economy, most, most northern states passed legislation to abolish slavery. However, in the South, the invention of the cotton gin, the invention of the cotton gin in 1793 made a major industry and sharply increased the need for enslaved labor. 1793, cotton gin makes it easier, much easier to pick the seeds out of cotton. Then 1803, Louisiana Purchase, the territory that the U.S. gets from France doubles the territory of the U.S. So this increases the need for slave labor also. Now, tension arose between the North and South Tension arose between the North and South as the slave or free status of new states was debated. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network. Sean Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. IDO Network International, in collaboration with STL Black Woman, DACA, and ACTA, present the Royal Pilgrimage to the Americas. August 24th through the 28th. The African kings and queens are coming to you for business, networking, and sharing of Pan-African ideals. The venue will be the illustrious En Garde Arts Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. A royal cultural experience and exhibitions, trade and investment opportunities in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas. A royal Pan-African summit hosting keynote speakers and a red carpet banquet. Come and witness our African royal coronation ceremony. Register at www.idonetwork.org to book your ticket to wine and dine with African royalty. Vendor opportunities available. Get face-to-face -face with the royals who own the land and resources for business. Contact DACA for deal room information at 602-730-4572. And the African History Network show, we deal with current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future of radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Thursday, May 12th, 2022, and we are live. All right. So I want to go back to this article here from history.com, and I was able to log into my uh, National Geographic account because I paid them a monthly subscription, National Geographic. I was able to log into it through google chrome i was able to remember my login so i'm feeling really good about myself there because i can never remember national geographic <laughs> i have so many subscriptions to these different uh news outlets but if you go back to this article here from um history.com this deals with uh march 2nd 1807 congress abolishes the african slave trade this is the international transatlantic slave trade which means bringing africans into the country to enslave them this, this this is outlawed and it goes into effect january 1st 1808 in january 1807 with a self-sustaining population of over four million enslaved people in the south some southern congressmen joined with the north in voting to abolish the african slave trade an act that became effective 
January 1st, 1808. Okay, January 1st, 1808. The widespread trade of enslaved people within the South was not prohibited. However, and children of enslaved people automatically became enslaved themselves, thus, thus ensuring a self-sustaining population in the South. So it was still legal to own slaves within the U.S. and trade them, but it became illegal to bring Africans to the country. So this is why when you read about the Clotilda, this is why the ship captain burned the ship. OK, Captain uh, uh, Forst, uh, Foster. This is why the ship captain uh, burned the ship. And this is why they had the, the those Africans in the swamp, hiding in the swamp for a few days because they were trying to uh, avoid capture by the authorities because it was illegal. All right. Now, this law that Congress passes is based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution, which states that uh, the earliest the transatlantic slave trade could be could be abolished is um, 1808. And I'm going to try to pull this up here. Um There's a, let's see here, we have, I think it's the article from Politico that shows this. It was one of these articles I have that shows it in the U.S. Constitution. This is why it's important to read it. Probably, uh, right here. Yeah, this one right here, Cornell University uh, Law School. Let's pull this up. Okay, so if we look at this here, this is restrictions on the slave trade. Restrictions on the slave trade. Cornell University's Law School. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, 1808, 1808. But a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. So this was saying that the earliest that the international transatlantic slave trade could be abolished is 1808. So Congress passes the bill, March 2nd, 1807. It goes into effect January 1st, 1808. What this means is, is that all the African slaves, that all the Africans that were brought into, into this country to be made slaves from January 1st, 1808, to June, July, 1860, when the Clotilda comes in, that's all illegal based upon federal law. In their court cases, to back up your argument, because their court cases, a white man who were, who were caught trafficking Africans and they were prosecuted. Some are not really going to be punished that much, but it was illegal. This gives you a legal foundation for reparations because it's a violation of federal law. Prior to 1808, it was legal to enslave African people. It's legal to, to bring them in here. I hear some of the dumbest arguments doing reparations. None of them are rooted in law. This is why a lot of these arguments haven't gone very far and are not gonna go very far because when you go to lawmakers, you go to argue law. You don't go to argue morality. If you wanna argue morality, go to church. Lawmakers legislate, they write laws. The foundation of laws in this country is the U.S. Constitution and treaties. Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution tells you that the U.S. Constitution, all the previous treaties and all the subsequent treaties are the supreme law of the land. When you challenge laws, 
you challenge them in the judicial branch of, of the government the courts the courts can either uphold a law or strike a law down just like we're waiting on the decision on abortion the supreme court can either uphold roe versus wade or it can overturn roe versus wade okay we uh yesterday on yesterday's show we talked about in florida and the florida congressional map and a, a federal judge a, a circuit judge there in florida ruled that the a new congressional map that would break up the fifth and tenth uh uh, uh congressional district conduct congressional districts which are held by african americans was unconstitutional the judicial branch of government interprets law from the legislative branch of government so when you make arguments for reparations they need to be rooted in law most of these arguments are not rooted in law saying that we worked for free for 246 years you was 27 trillion whatever this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness what law are you citing the slaves were supposed to be paid this is why a lot of this, these arguments are nonsensical what law we know it was morally wrong what law are you citing because if reparations ever gets passed then when it goes to the courts it's going to get overturned because it's, you don't have a legal foundation and this is why when you look at the reparations task force out of california and we talked about this story here on this show they voted 5-4 to base it based upon lineage whatever reparations they get they they, they, they voted 5-4 to, uh, to, to base it upon lineage because based upon the 1964 civil rights act it's illegal to have race-based policies so they're 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 basing it based upon lineage and you're gonna have to be able to trace your lineage back to an uh an african-american who was in the country prior to 1900 okay and i think they said uh someone who was a slave okay but prior to 1900 but it's based upon lineage it's not going to be for all african-americans but all the 2.6 million african-americans however many it is in california if you actually go read what they're saying this is why we have to understand law okay because a lot of this stuff floating around is just designed to get people hyped but it ain't gonna yield anything and 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 if and if it somehow actually does get passed which is not it's not gonna you ain't gonna get 60 votes in the senate name 10 republicans in the senate that are gonna vote for reparations when none in the house voted for it none none in the house no 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 Republicans in the House representing the support reparations. I'm hearing they have 218 votes for HR 40. Okay, now I'm not sure if there's all 218 in the House, but I'm hearing you have 218. No Republicans in the House representing the support reparations. Not even a study. How many Republicans in the Senate support it? And you need 60 votes. Okay, so this is why we have to understand how to make legal arguments to withstand a legal challenge in the courts and very few people are talking about this so the reason why the international transatlantic slave trade was abolished and why and, and, and why uh they burned the slave ship the clotilda is because of article 1 section 9 clause 1 of the u.s constitution which then led to the abolishment of the international transatlantic slave trade in 1808 January 1st, 1808, it went into effect. Congress passed the bill March 2nd, 1807. Okay, now, uh, if we go back to the article from NBC News, others are not too concerned about the Clotilda ship itself, which they view as only part of a larger story. The president of the Clotilda Descendants Association, Darren Patterson, said a few artifacts and a replica would be just fine for the telling of the tale of 110 African captives and how their lives add to the narrative of how their lives add to the narrative of slavery and the United States. Quote, once those people came out of that cargo, cargo hold and grew up into men and women, they produced Africa time they produced Africa town these Africans saved their money and bought some land and founded a town Africa town USA uh now Patterson's uh great great grandfather Polly Allen was among the captives 
he went on to say, quote, and we as the, as, as the descendants want to be sure that uh, that that legacy lives on, end quote. OK, now the Clotilda was the last ship known to transport African captives to the American South for enslavement. It departed Mobile, uh, Alabama, decades after Congress outlawed the, trans the, the international transatlantic slave trade in 1808 on a clandestine ship on, on a clandestine trip funded by Timothy Mayer, whose descendants still own millions of dollars worth of land around Mobile, Alabama today. We're going to continue this on the other side of the break, and we're going to we're going to deal with this backstory of what happened. Timothy Mayer made a bet with white businessmen that he could bring in a ship of Africans into the country and circumnavigate around the authorities. That's why these 110 Africans ended up in the U.S. Because this white man was so demonic. He made a bet, and these Africans were ripped away from their country. You listen to the African, African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021, and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human, were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis' books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Shea Royals, go read HR 40. It's to do a study on reparation. It's to do a study on the effects of slavery that still harm African-Americans today and to make and to make suggestions for reparations. That's what HR 40 is. Go read it. That's not the same HR 40 that uh, uh, Congressman John Conyers introduced in 1989. Go read it. But the question you should ask yourself, if you can't get a bill passed to study reparations, how the hell you get one passed to pay reparations? That's the question nobody wants to ask because they don't have an answer for it. No, it's not a big nothing burger. You don't understand how to use it. That's the problem. If you can't get a bill passed to study reparations, Shea, then you explain to me how you get a bill passed to pay reparations. It's not useless. You don't know how to use it. America must have a massive history lesson. Americans are very ignorant of history. 62% of Americans knew very little or nothing about Juneteenth. So America has to have a massive history lesson. You need a study because just giving money for reparations is not going to work. I've dealt with this before. That means you don't understand the damage was that was done. We're dealing with the people who largely been taught to hate themselves, who've been stripped of their history, culture, language, spiritual systems. 97% of our dollars each year is spent with people that don't look like us. So if we all got a million dollars a day, half a million, two million, whatever number you want to put on it, white people have it all back by this time next week. You can't look at the spending patterns of African-Americans each year and then think if we get a lump sum of money, that's going to change. No, we're going to give it right back. But what it, it, but and you give the money back. But here's the thing. The laws and policies that have been put in place that have now distributed wealth pound resources will still be in place. You're not repairing the damage. You have to assess what the damage is and how the damage was done. You got to change the laws and policies. Just like look at this. Just like the study. 
uh, that we've talked about numerous times here on the show before, how racism has cost the U.S. economy $16 trillion over, over a 20-year period from the year 2000 to the year 2020. They go through and break down policies that maldistribute wealth power resources. Just giving money does not address the maldistribution of wealth power resources, which is done based upon laws and policies. You have to change the laws and policies that continue to inflict the damage. This is why a lot of people talking about reparations have absolutely no clue what they're talking about. Read this article right here. Racism has cost the U.S. $16 trillion Citigroup fines. They go through and break down. This is, this is from Citigroup Bank. They go through and identify three main things. Black workers have lost $113 billion in potential wages over the past two decades because they couldn't get a college degree. The housing market lost $218 billion in sales because black applicants couldn't get home loans. About $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the economy. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on that today on the Superstation Future Radio. Okay, I had to deal with somebody who has absolutely no understanding of repairing the damage, okay, of racism, all right, the repairing the damage of slavery, things like this, okay, and 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 go read this, go read this uh, uh, study here from this, this is why our people are screwed up with reparations and the way you're going about it, you ain't gonna get a damn thing. This is why you have no understanding how to make legal arguments to repair the damage. And HR 40 is important because you need a study to assess to assess how bad the damage is. Just giving money is not going to just giving just cutting the check, just giving money is not going to repair the damage. You haven't assessed what the damage is. It's laws and policies that continue to inflict harm upon us today. OK, every year we go to conferences that talk about how we spend 97 percent of our dollars with people that don't look like us. So if we get a million dollars or half a million or whatever it is, which you're not going to get because you're not even making legal arguments and you can't cite no damn law that states that slaves are supposed to be paid. People are running game on our people. You're not making legal arguments. You can't cite no law saying slaves were supposed to be paid. What colony was the law in? What state was the law in? Was the law federal law? Was it state law? Was it in a county? You, when you go to lawmakers, you have to make legal arguments. You're not making legal arguments. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution and Article 6 tells you that the U.S. Constitution, all the previous treaties and all the subsequent treaties of the Supreme Law of the land, that helps you to lay a legal foundation. This nonsense, talking about we worked for free for 246 years and didn't get paid, you can't cite no law saying slaves are supposed to be paid. And even if you want to talk about H.R. 40, I want a special field order number 15, that didn't apply to all the former slaves. That was 400,000 acres of coastal land in South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia, known as 40 acres and a mule. The mule was supposed to be long. If you actually go read it, we haven't read a damn thing and up here running talking about reparations. You're not making legal arguments. This is why a lot of that stuff I don't get involved in because it's nonsense. All right, let's continue. So if we look here at how the, those Africans came into the U.S. in the first place. Timothy Mayer was, um, and I've, I've, I've had uh, Cam Howard from In Cobra on this show before, okay? So you run that on somebody else. Um, okay, and with, now what, what people have to understand, people want to bring up the Japanese, We've dealt with this here on this show before. Let's deal with this again. Once again, you, you have no clue what you're talking about. Let me go to my reparations folder because this is something I actually research. So people want to talk about Japanese. Let's go to my case dealing with the Japanese. 1988, U.S. Congress passed a bill. See, this is justice.gov. This is called research. This is justice.gov, Department of Justice. 1988, U.S. Congress passed a bill to pay reparations to 80, it, 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 it ended up going to 82,250 survivors of the Japanese internment camps. It was $1.6 billion. It did not go to all the Japanese in America. This is why you have to do research, especially before you come here running this nonsense. It did not go to all the Japanese and Americans. It only went to those who were still alive in 1988, who had actually been 
put into the internment camps or had to be evacuated or maybe if there was a if, if maybe if there was a, it was their spouse and say you had a japanese man who married a white woman and the whole family was put into an internment camp he died she's still alive it did not go to all the japanese in america at that time it only went specifically to uh the japanese who were who have been put into an internment camp okay well you got a problem all the last of the former slaves died in the 1950s this is what nobody wants to tell you okay i'm not trying to run game on you so i have no problem telling you this all of the last of the former slaves died in the 1950s yo our situation is much different and because of the 1964 civil rights act it's illegal to have race-based policies this one right here which is japanese was directly it, it directly dealt with those who were put into internment camps it did not it was not for all japanese this is why you have to go do research if you look at this here let me pull this up 10-year program compensate see it's important for us to understand this because our people are running around confusing activity with productivity don't know how to make legal arguments not making real progress on this and nobody can tell me how to get a reparations bill passed in the, in the senate you need 60 votes in the senate if you can't get a bill passed to study reparations how the hell you get one passed to pay reparations nobody wants to answer that question Th they're running game on you okay they're running game on you so let's look at this right here and we'll post it here okay this is from the department of justice february 19 1999 it was a 10-year program to compensate japanese americans interned during world war ii it wasn't all japanese americans in the u.s after paying out more than 1.6 billion dollars to more than 82,850 persons of japanese ancestry who were interned who were interned during world war ii the uh justice department's office of redress administration has officially closed its doors read the rest of this that didn't go to all japanese okay the problem is nobody wants to be honest and tell you that all the plays died in the 1950s so this is why with california because in the task force the california reparations task force is headed by an actual attorney camila moore who actually knows the law this is why they had to do it based upon lineage to trace your lineage back to somebody who was enslaved okay as opposed it's not going to go to all the african americans in california okay whatever they get done it's not going to go to all the african americans in california read this one right here new york times we talked about it here on this show because we do a real substance here people trying to run game on you with this reparations fantasy okay but if you're not making legal arguments you ain't gonna get nothing and and when and if it does pass which it ain't gonna pass if it does pass the senate and get signed into law guess what what happens when it gets challenged in court it's gonna get overthrown in court it is going to be ruled unconstitutional in court because you didn't know how to make a legal argument in the first place read this article here from the new york times california task force votes to offer reparations only to descendants of enslaved people it ain't going to all it's, it's not going to go to all african americans in uh california they're going to have to prove that they are a descendant of someone who was enslaved in this country prior to 1900 okay if your ancestors came here in 1901 you ain't getting nothing that's even that's if this even passes the state legislature okay and they closely watched it we talked about this on this show when this happened okay the vote came the vote 5-4 came after weeks of debate about whether reparations should be for all 2.6 million black californians or limit to those who can trace their lineage to enslaved people once again because of the 1964 civil rights act it's illegal to have race-based policies you can't have a policy only for one race of people what you can do is based this based upon lineage to trace your ancestry back to someone who was enslaved and they they put the cutoff point uh prior to 1900 so if you had an ancestor that came in 1900 you ain't getting anything okay now this is going to be challenged in court also but they're on better legal footing to withstand a legal challenge in court but people most of these people out here talking about cut the check not even dealing with a, a legal foundation for reparations let alone dealing with how to 
keep what you get when it gets challenged in the court. They haven't even thought that far ahead. That's why a lot of stuff is nonsense. The panel ultimately decided to focus on those most hurt by slavery instead of more broadly addressing the effects of racism directed at black people. Read the rest of this. Research Camila Moore. She broke this down. She was interviewed on Roland Martin and Filtered. And she was also on with Dr. Greg Carr. Dr. Greg Carr testified at their hearings. And she went through and broke down why legally they had to do it based upon lineage and couldn't do it for all African-Americans in California. OK, we need to understand law if this was going to uh, if we're actually going to get uh, anywhere with this. OK, this is why, once again, a lot of stuff is nonsense. And I encourage people to read this article here. From uh, Black uh, BlackAgendaReport.com. I'm not endorsing Black Agenda Report, but they have uh, a good article by Brother Reggie Marbury and Dr. Jahi Issa. I interviewed these brothers for four hours on my show, and this helps to lay to break down legal arguments for reparations based upon the international transatlantic slave trade being abolished. In, 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 in uh, 1808, but you have to understand history and law to be able to make legal arguments. This is the problem. OK, you have to understand history and law to be able to make legal arguments. Uh, there's two articles dealing with this. This one, I think this may have been the first one. July 2017 reparations is dead. How to resurrect it. OK, um, and they go through and they deal with um, uh, legal arguments and they break down. Uh, the international transatlantic slave trade uh, being abolished. Okay, 1808. They deal with and, and and one of the landmark U.S. Supreme Court cases helps to back up your legal argument. Is the case is the case of the Amistad slave ship, 1841. Joseph Sin Q. Okay, why were those Africans on the Amistad slave slave ship set free? Why were those Africans on the Amistad slave ship set free? Is because the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that, one, when they were captured, it was illegal. Two, they ruled that uh, uh, they were never slaves. And three, they ruled that it was illegal for that ship to come into the U.S. in the first place because the international transatlantic slave trade had been abolished. Go to archives.gov, the National Archives, research the Amistad slave ship case of 1841. They have some of the original court documents here. And one of the first things they tell you is that it was illegal for those Africans to be captured in the first place. And it tells you that this abduction violated all of the treaties then in existence because the European uh, nations had abolished the international transatlantic slave trade. Do some research before you come here with that simple Simon ass nonsense. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 
9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. Okay, if we go to, um, I'm going to look at two articles here from National Geographic for the sake of time. Uh, be sure to register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, this Saturday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what it didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Classes on sale, $80, regularly $130. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. Okay, now, I want to look at this uh, article that came out in 2019 from National Geographic dealing with the Clotilda. Last American slave ship is discovered in Alabama. The schooner Clotilda smuggled African captives into the U.S. in 1860, more than 50 years after importing slaves was outlawed. Another legal argument would be based upon the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866, but that's going to deal with a, a, a much smaller number of African people. But those um benefits and treaties are still on the books for the choctaw chickasaw creek cherokee and seminole indians all right if we look at this piece here uh at the bottom of page one it says it began with a bet uh it began with a bet clotilda's story began with timothy mayer a wealthy Mobile, Alabama landowner and shipbuilder who allegedly wagered several northern businessmen a thousand dollars that he could smuggle a cargo of Africans into Mobile, Alabama under the nose of federal officials. Importing African slaves into the U.S. had been illegal since 1808 and Southern plantation owners had seen prices in the domestic slave trade skyrocket because you cut off the international supply. Many, including Timothy Mayer, were advocating for reopening the international transatlantic slave trade. Okay, so they have a journey that they show the route that the Clotilda took, also. You can look at that. Now, uh, Timothy Mayer chartered a sleek, swift schooner named Clotilda and enlisted its builder, Captain William Foster, to sell it to the notorious slave port of uh, uh, Wida in present-day Benin to buy captives, okay, which was in the um, kingdom of Dahomey, West Africa. Captain William Foster left West Africa with 110 with one, he left West Africa with 110 young men, women, and children crowd, crowded in the schooner's hold. One girl reportedly died during a brutal six-week voyage. Purchased for $9,000 in gold, the human cargo was worth, worth more than 20 times that amount in 1860 in Alabama. Now, Let's see here. Can I close out these ads? Um, after transferring the captives, captives to a riverboat owned by Mayor's brother, Captain uh, 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 Captain William Foster burned the slave, the, the, the Clotilda, he burned the ship to the waterline to hide their crime because it was illegal to bring Africans to the country. Clotilda kept secrets over the decades, even as some deniers contended that the shameful episode never occurred. Um, after the Civil War ended and slaves abolished, the Africans longed to return to their home in West Africa. Lacking the means, they managed to buy small plots of land north of Mobile, Alabama, where they formed their own tight-knit community that came to be known as Africa Time. 
Africa Town, USA. There they made new lives for themselves, but never lost their African identity. Many of their descendants still live there today and grew up with stories of the famous ship that brought their ancestors to Alabama. Okay, read the rest of this here. This is from National Geographic. This is from um, May 22nd, 2019. May 22nd, 2019. The article last Amer last american slave ship is discovered in alabama for national geographic okay also look at the article that came out today from national geographic um dna rec excuse me dna recovery attempt begins on last american slave ship dna recovery attempt begins on last american slave ship archaeologists hope to unearth valuable information about the enslaved africans from clotilda's last passage and have already found evidence of its criminal sinking so this article came out today for national geographic about the research that they've been doing this month on the clotilda okay and then also check out the article from uh, uh, NBC News as well. Uh, that's the first article we talked about today. This, this goes in to say researchers are also attempting to recover traces of human DNA that can uh, that could yield more information about the captive Africans brought to Alabama aboard Clotilda in 1860. Cellular material could be potentially a uh, part of the accumulated sediment on the bottom of the ship's hold okay said frankie west director of the forensic science program at western carolina university who will lead a genetic uh analysis of the material recovered from the wreck in her lab the research is funded by the national geographic society so check this article out also all right look we're out of time here on 19 a.m superstation wfdf those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching for a few more minutes. Right now, it's curious. Wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. I'll be on Roller Martin Unfiltered on Friday. We'll back. We'll be back here Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Wakanda forever. Talk to you next time. Peace. Stand by. All right. The article from NBC News. This one right here read this one also alabama shipwreck holds key for descendants of enslaved africans okay and this is from uh it's picked up is from the associated press picked up by nbc news may 12 2022 also read this article here that i referenced with um uh, Brother Jahi Issa, Dr. Jahi Issa, and Brother Reggie Mabry dealing with legal arguments for reparations, which is different than most of this nonsense floating around. Reparations is dead, how to resurrect it. And they deal with the international transatlantic slave trade being abolished in 1808. And all the Africans that were brought in from 1808 to 1860 when the Clotilda comes in was illegal based upon federal law. So they go through and cite law, okay, with this, and they cite court cases. So go read this. All right, uh, be sure to register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Saturday, it's uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. So even after the course is over with, a year from now, two years from now, you'll still have full access to the class. You can go back and watch it. Okay, so... 
You don't have to be present in class. As soon as the class is over with, the um, that day's class is archived, so you can go watch it anytime. I'm going to post the link here and we have bonus content that you can watch also. So as soon as you register, you can watch last week's class and you can join us in class this Saturday. Now on Sunday, uh, we have class number one of from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power, 1865, 1865 to 1968, starting up. And that's a 10 week online class I teach also. And we deal with history from, we start with the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian, Re Haitian Revolution in 1803, and we go through to 1968. We deal with the Civil War, Civil War Reconstruction, Jim Crow era. Um, Great Migration, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement. And we go through a look at history and see what happened, what happened to us after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament we're in today to understand where we need to go from here? That's from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power, 1865 to 1968. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a bundle pack. It's three courses that you get. For $120. It's a $285 value. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at AHN show at African History Network.com, AHN show at African History Network.com, and you'll get a 50% discount. All right. All right. We have to get out of here. Talk to you next time. Peace. Mm -hmm. Ido Network International, in collaboration with STL Black Woman, DACA, and ACTA, present the Royal Pilgrimage to the Americas, August 24th through the 28th. The African kings and queens are coming to you for business, networking, and sharing of Pan-African ideals. The venue will be the illustrious En Garde Arts Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. A royal cultural experience and exhibitions, trade and investment opportunities in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas a Royal Pan-African Summit hosting keynote speakers, and a red carpet banquet. Come and witness our African Royal Coronation Ceremony. Register at www.idonetwork.org to book your ticket to wine and dine with African royalty. Vendor opportunities available. Get face-to-face -face with the royals who own the land and resources for business. Contact DACA for deal room information at 602-730-4572. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995 and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008 and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis' books today at